Okay, let's uh, restart. So I have a talk here about, about um, assessing exposure to pesticides for epidemiological studies. I'm going to use the microphone because they are uh, making a video recording. It may also help my voice a little bit, which is starting to, uh, to go. <coughs> So the talk then is uh, building on the material that we've uh, looked at already, um, and it tries to discuss the, uh, the issues about pesticide-related epidemiology uh, in the workplace in relation to the complexities that are associated with this. Um, pesticides are harmful. They're designed to be harmful, and so that's an important point that we need to, to bear in mind and they are very complex uh, problems in terms of the numbers and types of pesticides that are available and used, and that the technology of uh, chemical interventions in agriculture and other related areas is constantly changing and has been driven to a large extent by regulation. So um, it's, it's an important aspect of change that needs to be taken into account. There's some evidence, emerging evidence, of causation of cancer and neurodegenerative disease, and uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, I'll finish up with something about why we need to improve uh, exposure estimation and what uh, is being done about it uh, and how that might result in the future in better estimates. So pesticides are essential for society. There's uh, a a balancing act that has to be done between the benefits that are obtained by uh, preventing pests from uh, destroying crops or for encouraging the growth of crops and the harm that might arise from the toxic effects of uh, these compounds on humans or other aspects of the uh, environment. And that balancing act is clearly something that's reflected in regulation and these Compounds are very highly regulated in uh, most countries where it's a permissive regime. In other words, uh, you have to apply to the regulator to be able to use these compounds in agriculture or other similar situations. So I apologise, that's a little bit uh, vague, but uh, pesticide usage is increasing, particularly increasing in the developing world. So you see the, the top line in the graph shows the rate of increase in consumption of pesticides in China and the blue line uh, for Brazil. And these are both showing an increasing usage over time. Whereas in the US and most other uh, uh, developed economies, there's a decline in the use of pesticides or a relative uh, stability in the pattern. Um, it's important for us to understand these problems because 25% uh, of the world's production is used in developing countries and 99% of the deaths that occur from pesticides are estimated to occur in these environments. So pesticides are used in these situations in less well-controlled situations than they are in Europe or in North America. So the complexity of uh, the exposures uh, arises because of the many diverse uses that are made of pesticides. So they can be used as insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, molluscicides, as growth promoters. There's a whole host of different applications for these types of compounds. And within each of these categories, there can be dozens, if not hundreds of compounds that are used or have been used in the past. And the pattern of use is such that uh, it's not as if these materials are always used in the same situation all the time. The usage changes over time depending on the environment, on the current practice and many other factors involved. The other thing to realise about the uses is that most of these uh, applications of pesticide are done in a slightly different form from the way that the materials are delivered. So, Pesticides are mostly delivered in some form of uh, concentrated form and then are mixed and diluted and then applied in the workplace. And that process of transferring the material from one container to another and to then use it in a spraying or a, a other form of application um, 
gives rise to uh, increased exposure, uh, particularly increased exposure to the concentrated form of the uh, material. So uses uh, may uh, differ in, in terms of settings as well. M much of you, I'm, I'm sure, think about use of pesticides in agriculture, but these compounds may also be used on animals in veterinary practice, both on farms and in uh, non-farming uh, situations. They may be used at home in the garden or inside the home to protect against uh, pests. Uh, they may be used in institutional situations, for example, in parks or in gardens and other situations. And in all these cases, although they may not be primarily occupational, there are aspects of occupational exposure that, that may arise. The formulations uh, may differ greatly, uh, so some, um, many pesticides will be delivered as liquids, but other forms, gels, pastes, chalks, powders, and so on, may be uh, uh, available. And the way that these are delivered in terms of concentration may vary uh, hugely as well, with some being delivered as uh, dilute formulations and others in uh, concentrated form. The containers are particularly important. The, the photograph that you can see shows a, a, an old tin that uh, was used to contain liquid uh, um, pesticide. These are particularly problematic in terms of exposure, and in fact they were um, removed from uh, authorization in the UK some years ago uh, because of the likelihood of increased exposure. In the design of the tin, there's a lip runs around the top of the tin, and so when you empty the container and then turn it back, some of the residue drips down and forms a pool in the top of the, the container, which results in further continued exposure every time you touch the tin, even if you're not actually uh, dispensing the, uh, the pesticide. So container design may vary greatly and, and can have a big influence on the level of exposure that uh, people experience. Now, in the past, many different uh, compounds that were used as pesticides had uh, relatively long uh, bi biological half-lives and would persist in the environment uh, for long periods of time, and of course would persist also in the body for a long period of time. So compounds like DDT uh, will have a biological half-life of something like 10 or uh, so years and will remain active and there's a dose in the body for that sort of period of time. One of the major uh, changes that's taken place in recent years is to be to uh, restrict authorization for long biologically active uh, materials and to uh, focus on uh, actives which have a short biological half-life. In other words, they are transitory in the body and in the env environment. Um, this has certainly improved the, uh, the, 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 the exposure of individuals in the uh, uh, workplace, but has made it more complicated to use techniques like biological monitoring to assess exposure because the materials are so transitory that you know, collecting urine samples or blood samples that are reflective of the exposure is extremely difficult. So, Exposure uh, can occur by um, many different routes of exposure. Uh, so main route of exposure for most pesticides is by skin contact. And that's primarily because the way that these are handled and used is such that they don't give rise to uh, high aerosol concentrations. So they're mostly uh, sprayed, if they're sprayed in large droplets, the purpose being for the droplets to land on the plants or on the uh, contact surface rather than to be dispersed in the air. So even when spraying is done, it's done in a way that reduces the aerosol concentration. Um, however, these materials are generally relatively low volatility because you want them to remain in situ for at least long enough to have some activity. So although they're not giving rise to uh, residues in the air, they give rise to residues on surfaces, and if they contaminate the skin or clothing, they may remain on those surfaces for relatively uh, long periods of time. So the materials will be metabolized and transformed uh, and stored in, uh, in the 
in the body and uh, many pesticides are fat soluble and stored in the adipose tissue. Um, it's possible to use the excreted uh, pesticides or the metabolites to estimate exposure by measuring in, well, most normally uh, urine uh, in, in these situations. Um, it's important to realise that concentration is a very important factor in terms of uptake through the skin. And so, especially where uh, compounds are delivered in concentrated form, the possibility of uptake during that first mixing and loading stage can be very high. So in some situations, just a few spots of uh, concentrated pesticide on the skin can have more impact on exposure than the person being drenched with the dilute pesticide during the application process. So that it's important when focusing on the exposure estimation to try to partition the different stages of the, uh, the process and focus particularly on the, uh, the, those stages which handle the, uh, the concentrate. Now, I think traditionally in terms of pesticide epidemiology, there's been uh, considerable difficulty because of the diversity of the range of situations and the range of compounds that are uh, uh, used and the fact that they are normally used in situations where traditionally people haven't paid a lot of attention to the exposure. So they're used in agriculture, they're used in small-scale uh, applications in, uh, in gardening or other such situations where Health and safety traditionally has not had a very high profile and so the um, monitoring of exposure, the uh, regulation of exposure in the past has not been very great and the recording of the use of these pesticides in the past has not been uh, terribly great. And that's meant that uh, previous studies have relied to a large extent on recall of subjects about what they've done and when they've done it. And that has given rise to particular problems because people find it difficult to recall the sort of detailed information that we might want in terms of exposure. But very often they don't know the, uh, the particular uh, information that we'd want. So the farmer may not know the active uh, ingredients in the material that they're using. They may just know the trade name or a generic name for the material uh, and not be able to, uh, to tell you particularly what the active compounds were. And that's meant that uh, exposure in the past has often been uh, to non-specific uh, type uh, assessments such as any pesticide or any herbicide or any other uh, uh, broad grouping of, of pesticide use. Now, Pesticides are uh, active uh, ingredients anyway, and many of them are designed to uh, affect the nervous system. And so there are uh, clear concerns about chronic uh, neurological effects in humans uh, from accidental, incidental, or um, uh, exposure that arises just through, through work. Um, there's, there's ample reports about problems in memory and concentration in uh, terms of fatigue, um, uh, irritability and depression, visual disturbance and, uh, and some uh, uh, cases of uh, polyneuropathy. Most of these things are difficult to, uh, to investigate in, in practice because of the fact that they are not specific diseases but are conditions which are um, uh, prevalent in, in society anyway. So studying fatigue, for example, um, I haven't met anyone yet who, if you ask, you know, do you occasionally suffer from fatigue, will go, oh, no, never. <laughs> um, you know, so we all feel fatigue, and, and yet it's uh, this unusual prevalence of fatigue, uh, intense fatigue, that, that may be more of concern. So we, uh, we talked this morning about the um, Geo Parkinson study and uh, there are other epidemiological studies that show uh, strong associations between Parkinson's disease and the fungicide Maneb and uh, the herbicide uh, Paraquat. And these are quite specific used uh, pesticides from the past mainly and they are relatively straightforward to identify the particular uses. There's some evidence for associations between organochlorine uh, compounds uh, 
the eldrin and, uh, and some organophosphates, but the evidence is, is less strong. And overall, you know, there, there are more clearly associations when, when you look at the generic uh, groupings of pesticides. So I, I thought we'd look at this uh, particular study, the Agrican study, which is a French, a very large French study of agricultural workers. And they have looked at uh, uh, self-reported Parkinson's disease and self-reported history of lifetime exposure to uh, uh, crops and animals. And so this is an extension of the idea of the, pest, of the job exposure matrix that we discussed earlier, uh, where using information about the particular type of uh, exposure situation is used to augment the, the assessment. So knowing something about the use of the, the, uh, the, or the crops that the individual worked on and the time periods when these crops were worked on, we can make some estimate of the particular compounds that were used in those situations. And that's based on this uh, Pestimat uh, crop exposure matrix, which relies on information from pesticide registrations, uh, sales information, and recommendations made to farmers about usage of pesticide in particular situations. Um, so it's based on a broad range of intelligence information that uh, has been codified into the, uh, the crop exposure matrix. It's, unlike the, uh, the, the other uh, uh, job exposure matrices, this is specific to uh, active ingredients. So it provides information about the frequency, the probability, and the, uh, the intensity of exposure that might have arisen on, uh, the, uh, in these uh, situations. Now, like, like many other matrices of this type, it suffers from the, uh, the, the problem that uh, these assignments of exposure are not based on quantitative, objective information, but are based on uh, expert judgment and, uh, and these uh, other supporting information. So they... Um, suffer from the fact that there's no real strong validation of the, uh, the approach uh, against objective measures. The Pestimat uh, matrix includes not only these uh, assessments of uh, intensity of exposure, but the intensities, the frequency, et cetera, may change over time depending on the, the pattern of exposure, and particularly the uh, use of active ingredients in terms of uh, Permission through regulation uh, is reflected in the, uh, the time changes. So pesticide use uh, was found to be associated with an increased risk of Parkinson's disease in all the activities that they looked at. So like we've seen in other uh, studies, if you look at any use of pesticide in relation to uh, cattle, so this is the use of veterinary medicines or in relation to, for example, peas, you can find significantly elevated odds ratios for these situations. But the information that's available by compound is much less secure. And part of the problem here is that um, the, while there's a large number of people who are ever exposed to pesticides in any of these particular situations, as soon as you drill down to individual active ingredients, the number of exposed gets smaller. And so the power to detect any significant associations decreases. The, the authors consider that the results uh, support an association of Parkinson's disease with uh, a number of uh, specific um, uh, compounds, including diaquat and paraquat. Um, but my, my uh, interpretation is that there's not really any strong evidence for increased risk. And most of the odds ratios that they report in their paper are not significantly increased for the problem that we've seen that um, exposure is relatively, uh, exposure prevalence to individual compounds is relatively low. <coughs> so there's also evidence that uh, pesticide exposure might be associated with uh, cancers, particularly uh, cancers of the lung, prostate, lymphatic system and hemopoietic system. Um, the, the evidence is not terribly strong and it reflects the, uh, the difficulty uh, that we've been talking about in terms of uh, pesticide epidemiology. Um, 
many of these pesticides are not mutagenic and, uh, and so one would have to, have to postulate some other mechanism for the, uh, the association that might be observed. And in fact, in relation to IARC's categorization of pesticides in relation to cancer, there's no compound other than arsenic which has been classified as a definite human carcinogen. So there's a problem, and the problem's not so much with the toxicology or the mechanistic evidence, really, uh, it's uh, in individual cases, it relies mainly in terms of the, uh, the epidemiology. So in, I thought we'd look specifically at uh, the evidence for prostate cancer and see, as an example, how that might uh, play out. And there's this review and meta-analysis that was published uh, in uh, 2016 that uh, is the basis for what I'm going to talk about. Um, what they found was that the data was uh, heterogeneous and provided rather inconsistent results uh, overall. Um, the authors also looked at one of the, the better conducted studies which was the agricultural health study in the United States and they identified that um, there was no increased prostate cancer risk amongst these people where the quality of the exposure estimation was perhaps most uh, secure. Um, although they found uh, highly exposed workers uh, with a family history of prostate cancer showed an increased risk of uh, prostate, uh, so, yes, so it also showed an increased risk of prostate cancer. However, when they looked overall at uh, pooled uh, odds ratio for high exposure to uh, uh, pesticides, they found a significant, just significantly increased risk of 1.33. So this uh, illustrates the uh, heterogeneity in the, uh, in the studies and I thought we would just pick out three of the underlying studies and look a little bit more carefully at uh, them to see something of the methods that have been used and how they've been applied. So the Allenson uh, tal study uh, is a study where they used um, uh, biological monitoring as the basis for the exposure estimation. And they focused on uh, organochlorine pesticides and other uh, uh, organochlorine compounds uh, measured in uh, uh, blood. And out of the wide range of compounds that they looked at, there were 13 uh, which were used as pesticides. It's a population-based case control study, so it suffers from the, the problems that all these kind of studies have in that they're not specifically focused on uh, high levels of exposure. So you get what you get in terms of the jobs and, and uh, uses that people um, had uh, in their uh, particular lives. How about 70% of the patients had detectable levels of uh, nine PCBs, which were the other... Uh, uh, compounds that were looked at and seven of the pesticide compounds. So there was reasonable evidence of uh, exposure in the, uh, the, the population even if there wasn't uh, widespread occupational exposure. And in fact, uh, only about 10% of the subjects reported occupational pesticide exposure in the uh, questionnaire part of the, the, uh, the study. So Alison I haven't presented any detailed results, but there's no real evidence of any uh, increased risk related to pesticides in their study. And none of the uh, odds ratios looking at the specific um, metabolites or compounds in the urine showed any increased risk at all. So just before I go off that one, <coughs> the, the, this is a very useful approach to uh, estimating exposure, but it relies completely on the fact that the compounds that they're interested in have a long biological half-life. So the biological half-life for many of these is uh, up to 10 years. And so the residence time reflects past exposure, perhaps you know, over uh, 20 years perhaps uh, of past exposure. So um, they are, it's a useful methodology, but it's restricted to this kind of uh, compound. If you were to apply this to uh, studies of modern pesticides where the half-lives can be of the order of days, uh, it would be completely uninformative as a, as a strategy. So it works because of the, the approach that the, um, the, they've looked at. So this, yes, of course. 
Yeah. You wouldn't be able to use it, you know, you might get a bias because of a reverse of uh, potential effect of the disease on the levels. Yeah. So yeah. for this it's okay. And, and then you can stratify by stage if you and some people do that. Yeah. Okay. Some of the other cancers we can't even do it for the for the uh, for these type of uh, compounds. So yeah. yeah. You know, for pancreatic cancer you cannot do it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's a very good point, thank you. So the uh, second study uh, was amongst uh, Mexican Americans identified uh, to, uh, with the objective of trying to identify risk factors. And uh, it's again a population based uh, case control study, but this time relying on a, a job exposure matrix to estimate the exposure. And uh, exposures were really not very specifically uh, assessed. So really they looked at exposure to agrochemicals not even to the specific type of agrochemical, uh, so grouping together fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides. The job exposure matrix gives rise to estimates of exposure on three levels, but there's no real validation of the gem and the reliability of it is not really uh, properly documented. Now, I apologize if that's a little small for you, but um, in terms of the Agricultural uh, exposures then, they uh, looked at the risk in relation to low and medium exposure, which was not significantly increased, but then in relation to high exposure, um, there's a, an odds ratio of 3.44, which was significantly increased. So the last of the three studies we'll look at is uh, again a uh, uh, population-based case control study, uh, this time in British Columbia, and again they used a, a GEM approach, uh, but a rather more sophisticated GEM, uh, where they had information about the specific uh, chemical agent, the type of work, and the time periods over which the exposures might have occurred. And they um, looked more specifically at, uh, they looked more broadly at other uh, types of chemical agent other than just uh, pesticide, but they uh, had particular uh, information about that. And then they uh, had added information about the crop and the task and the uh, region where the, the work was carried out. So they were able to refine the estimates in the gem to improve the quality of the, uh, the overall assessment. So they assessed, uh, as I said, a wide range of uh, agents and uh, uh, a large number of these were classified as pesticides and they found uh, high ex uh, exposure to DDT had a significantly increased odds ratio and uh, some other pesticides, but for the majority of the compounds that they looked at, there weren't uh, increased uh, risks. Now, in the uh, meta-analysis, they, as well as summarizing overall the evidence, they looked at the quality of the, uh, the, the studies and they also looked at the quality of the um, exposure estimates. Um, these funny things here are meant to be stars because in the scheme that they have, they use a, a star methodology. So they looked, uh, as well as the quality of the study, they looked at the quality of the exposure estimation and they had three broad areas that they look at in relation to that, ascertainment of exposure, uh, whether the same method of ascertainment was used in the cases and controls, and whether or not the non-response rate was, uh, was different amongst the, uh, the groups. And if the study quality is good on these three um, categories, then you would get three stars for the exposure assessment part, and then deficiencies in any individual one will give rise to uh, fewer stars. So they used this assessment to, in some way, refine the meta-analysis to investigate how study quality might have played out in terms of uh, the overall uh, results. And you remember this morning, we talked about similar sort of approach in the Lenta study with uh, asbestos uh, uh, studies. So this is the uh, overall uh, assessment. And the, you know, when they first of all looked at uh, um, the overall quality of the, the study in general, m most of their studies were in the medium quality category and th they showed a significantly increased uh, odds ratio there. But you know, the, the other two are, are not terribly informative because there's only two and four uh, studies in, in each of those. 
However, when they looked at the quality of the exposure assessment across these three uh, star systems that the Newcastle Ottawa scale provides, they found that as the study quality decreased, the odds ratio increased. And that in the five studies that they assessed as being the best, there was no evidence of any increased risk um, that was uh, present. And when you look at more detail about the study methodology for the exposure assessment, it seems that in the studies where they measured the serum and the pe of the pesticides or they used some sort of informed expert judgment, um, there was no real evidence of uh, increased risk. And it was really in, in relation to the GEMS and uh, self-reporting on the part of subjects um, or other uh, assessment methodologies where the problems were arising. And, and this, this may reflect some of the difficulties in terms of the quality of these uh, methodologies in terms of reliably assessing exposure to the, uh, the subjects. So the, this uh, review by uh, Carlos uh, and others, um, which is published last year, looks specifically at uh, GEMS in relation to uh, the uh, analysis in, uh, of studies of pesticides. So as I mentioned, GEMS are widely used in these types of studies and they're widely used in the uh, population-based case control type analyses that are uh, often applied in these situations. And what they uh, found when they looked were that there were 16 GEMS that they identified, eight of them were generic GEMS like the FinGEM and the other uh, GEMS that we talked about this morning, which provide a broad uh, estimate of pesticide exposure alongside other uh, exposures that are being assessed. And then there were eight specific uh, GEMS which uh, focused on agricultural uh, workers in particular and tried to provide a more refined estimate of the exposure, um, in particular in relation to providing information about the active substances that were being uh, applied by the workers. <clears throat> it's a very interesting and informative uh, review and they came up with a number of recommendations that uh, really were trying to set the, uh, the, 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 the marker for, for moving forward. Um, I haven't just li I've just listed them in the order that they made them so they don't necessarily uh, reflect the priority. But you know, first of all they recommended uh, considering gender in GEMS which I think is a uh, uh, something that I've not seen widely discussed in the past and gender may be quite important in terms of agricultural workers and the way that jobs are partitioned out in agriculture between men and women and so considering not just you know the fact that the person was a farmer or a farm worker but actually considering how gender may have implications for exposure I think was uh, was very useful. Um, they identified that you know, a gem in agriculture is, uh, is a moving picture because of the changing pattern of usage and that you know, gems which focus on usage today may not be reflective of the past and gems that were generated in the past may not reflect current exposure. And I think that's it's important to, to realise. Um, they advocated that there should be a move towards more active assessment of the specific active compounds and the sort of approach that we saw in British Columbia where they're using information about crops and uh, permissions and, uh, and using that kind of information I think is really um, an important step forward that needs to be more widely applied. Uh, taking more account of the specific types of job that people do, um, trying to uh, validate estimates of uh, the intensity of the exposure so that they're not reliant completely on expert opinion but are based in some ways on more quantitative underpinning uh, is a very useful uh, step and to include um, not just the main occupational exposures of mixing and loading and then application but to consider the exposure that workers get throughout the time that they're working on that crop so re-entry type exposures where the crop may have been sprayed and then the worker has to go back and do some further tasks in that uh, environment and may uh, then be uh, re-exposed as part of that process. And 
Again, taking that account into the uh, in the gem would be uh, would be important. So I think people are moving towards trying to refine and improve the gem methodology uh, to make it more appropriate for uh, our use in in studies. So the other main thrust of uh, um, Exposure assessment for pesticides is in relation to algorithms. And you recall again from this morning, we talked about modeling exposure in some way to reflect the uh, underlying mechanistic processes between the source of the exposure and the, the uh, external exposure in the environment. The, the whole idea about um, algorithms in relation to pesticide exposure, I think has been championed by uh, the people at NCI and this paper that uh, describing here by Joe Coble and uh, colleagues um, takes this, this forward uh, in a, a way that they try to validate the algorithm and uh, support the validity of it in, in use. It's a simple approach and it relies on dividing up the activity into uh, mixing, applying and repairing or re-entry type activities and giving some estimate of exposure to each of these and then uh, taking account of the use of personal protective equipment. And as you might imagine, in use of pesticides, people uh, predominantly will wear protective clothing or gloves uh, in the application. And so taking account of the usage of personal protective equipment is, is really very important. So they had information on uh, the underlying factors, you know, for example, in relation to mixing, which, as you can see from the, the slide, is really categorised at a very crude level in terms of you know, how often the applicator mixes pesticide uh, prior to the application. So it's really a, a very simple um, scale that's, that's being applied here to that, that term. But they had that information and they also had uh, biomonitoring data on uh, uh, a number of compounds. This one uh, for the uh, compound 24D um, in urine. And so you can see on the slide that um, in terms of the algorithm score, for those who were exposed at uh, least, so their score was less than five, they on average had the lowest exposure and those who had the highest algorithm score, greater than 10, had the highest exposure. Although the difference on average is not Huge, you know. This isn't a log scale as we've seen on some of the other uh, plots. Like this is uh, this is a linear scale. So, although the algorithm is uh, able to distinguish high and low exposure, it's not terribly precise. So you can see within the variation within each of these categories is relatively large, and it's not um, giving rise to a big contrast in exposure between the highest exposed uh, subjects and the lowest exposed subjects. So I, you know, I think um, this is a really very important uh, development and it's something which um, in some ways could be amalgamated more into the job exposure matrix approach. So you could apply algorithms and job exposures, refining the uh, job exposure matrix in a way that takes account of some of the subtleties of exposure, particularly uh, the use of self-reported use of personal protective equipment. Um, which the authors found to be uh, a key factor in, in determining exposure. So a, a little digression then, and uh, perhaps to, uh, to illustrate how complex and uh, charged the, the problem is. Um, in 2015, IARC uh, reviewed a number of pesticides, including glyphosate, which is a, a mass-used uh, pesticide uh, throughout the world, and they concluded based on uh, sufficient evidence in experimental animals and limited evidence in humans um, with supportive evidence in terms of the mechanism that glyphosate should be classified as 2A, in other words, a, a probable human carcinogen. And that resulted in considerable kickback from industry because this is a high volume uh, compound, uh, clearly, um, a very profitable compound, and so there's a need from the industry's part to uh, defend themselves, I think, and uh, that's created quite uh, a flurry of uh, discussions. But I think for me, surprisingly, the uh, regulator in Europe also has pitched into this uh, controversial debate 
and uh, concluded that there's very limited evidence for an association between glyphosate-based uh, pesticide formulations and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I mean, they, they came to a different opinion. They classified the case control epidemiological studies as unreliable. Well, we looked at the prostate cancer studies and you know, the, there's certainly um, some doubt about the methodology that, that can provide reliable uh, estimation. Although I haven't looked in detail at the glyphosate uh, uh, studies that were uh, reported by IARC and um, I'm sure that these were very carefully evaluated and, and judged by the, uh, by the, the working group. Um, but the, you know, the EFSA um, cited the fact that in the agricultural health study there was no uh, evidence of a risk and we've seen that that's one of the better studies. It's a prospective study. It has uh, good biological monitoring data and uh, they concluded that they, in their opinion there was no consistent evidence in animals and there was uh, a dispute about the mechanistic evidence, although they relied on proprietary unpublished data rather than, which is the privilege of the regulator to have access to uh, commercial data, but they relied on, on data that wouldn't have been available to IARC to, uh, to judge. Now, I'm not making any judgments about what the right and wrongs of the argument are. My point is really that a large part of this dispute hinges on the reliability of the exposure estimates and that we've seen that for pesticides, estimating exposure is really fraught with problems and it's, uh, it's a, a pie that as you start to move down to the specific compounds like glyphosate gets smaller and smaller and the ability to get a sufficiently powered study that will be informative uh, uh, decreases. So, it's, it's something we really need to, to address and try to improve. And, you know, I, I think that, that the best summation is that the evidence is not clear-cut. And, you know, IARC clearly admits that. They didn't sign this as a definite human carcinogen. They said it was a probable human carcinogen. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, judgment is, is part of what we do in science that we need to try and make some uh, clear uh, uh, justification for the conclusions that we arise with. So what, what, what can we do about this? Well, we've started a new uh, project in collaboration with the Health and Safety Executive uh, in uh, uh, the UK, the um, uh, University of Utrecht in the Netherlands and the University of Manchester, all of whose groups have considerable experience in terms of exposure estimation and in working on pesticide epidemiological studies. So there's a wealth of information amongst these groups where we have, um, okay, I'm, I, it's my opinion, but we have good scientific credentials. We've set up the study in a way that we think tries to minimize the possibility of bias in terms of uh, opinions that go into the, the approach. Um, and we have a very uh, sort of robust uh, governance uh, process associated with the, uh, the studies. And we've done that because we've actually been funded by industry to do this study. So we, um, we feel it's important that we try to keep industry as far as possible at arm's length and do the study in the, the best possible way. But what we want to try and do is improve the methodologies that are available for pesticide exposure assessment and to if you to, to look at the existing methodologies and try to uh, decide how reliable they are. And the, the main methodology for, for uh, doing this is to really, well, first of all, to rely on previously collected exposure data from existing study and historical records and to reflect that back. So if I go to subjects who were interviewed or provided information 10 years ago, about their pesticide exposure, and I ask them again about what were you exposed to 10 years ago, then I have a way of checking the reliability of recall in these studies. So we will do some of that, and we will look at some current exposures using biomonitoring, and we will apply the available job exposure matrices and algorithm approaches that um, are available to try to judge just in the way that Koble uh, did for his uh, algorithm, the reliability of the approach uh, in, in practice. 
And really the, 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 the main aim of the study is to try to, um, um, well, to try and validate the available methods and to provide an update of the, or to provide advice and recommendations about how these types of studies uh, should be carried out in the future. I would like to say more about the study, but we just started, so it's more a sort of trailer for the work that's about to be carried out and the, uh, the fact that things will improve and we've seen you know, that there are already good steps in terms of methodology improvement for pesticide studies, but it's an area that's very important to address and, and we feel that um, just using established uh, job exposure matrices in a generic uh, sense is not likely to be informative about the risks that we um, we're concerned about. So we've looked at uh, this this whole area and the methodologies that are available. I think there's a general move, as I've said, to more specific gems and uh, crop exposure matrices and algorithm-based uh, metrics, and that the combination of these two approaches might actually be the best strategies that we have available for the, the kind of studies we want to do. Um, but it's very important that we use validated methods and that's something that's not been done in many studies in the past. Thank you very much. And I guess we have time for questions or comments. Are any of you involved in any studies uh, with pesticides or are you, are you groups that you're working in involved in these things? No. I just have a question. You have a question. Okay. Uh, so your work was mainly focused on uh, this occupational chemical agents, right? So yes. Because we have spoken already about this um, like more modern exposures that are coming up or came up mm -hmm. um, with psychosocial factors, um, etc. So I was wondering if we um, are maybe hearing more about that as well. I don't know because this was focused just on this um, chemical agents now. Yeah. You know, I, I think uh, it's certainly a very uh, interesting emerging area and in the exercise that we'll do next, We'll focus on one of these new modern exposures that um, might arise. I think a lot of you know what has happened in the past has been very much focused on chemicals and dust, and that's been a traditional focus uh, for people. Um, there's increasing interest in you know things like green space and other types of exposures and how they may reflect on risks for workers and, and others. Um, I. I think that the general approach that I have outlined um, is equally applicable to these. So when you think about exposure, try to think about the causal pathway. So from the source to the disease, think about what the putative, putative mechanisms might be, and that will allow you to focus on what the appropriate exposure metrics might be, and then to use the available information that you have to the best effect to reconstruct an exposure estimate. So that rely on you know, evidence records, evidence from recall of subjects or others, and so on. So the, the, the strategy I don't think varies for new subjects, but you need to start from base one and think about things carefully. You know, sometimes it's, it's very attractive to go, I don't really know much about these psychological factors, so I'll just pick that questionnaire off the shelf and use that as my measure of exposure. And I think, you know, if you truly don't think about what the hypothesis is for the disease, then you, you can't really rely on those kind of uh, estimates. Um, you know, in pesticides, as, as you mentioned, we have not been very good in immunology and, and, and uh, in cancer at least. And it is sort of an extreme situation of natures, I guess, because we have other situations where we have natures, and it's a real problem, you know, for every time you have a nature, it's a real problem, but we have been more successful in other areas of natures. So what is so special for pesticides? Why haven't we, you know, managed to 
to be more successful with pesticides and, and, and long-term effects? I, th I think part of the problem is the context in which people use pesticides because it's not like a factory or a, you know, an established workplace. It's often done in a very transitory situation, mostly done by small teams of people, a very flexible workforce, um, very little continuity. So people may not do these jobs for long periods of time, which is perhaps more typical in factories. And then the other problem is the compounds. So there are hundreds of pesticides and these are not used consistently. So they, are, they have changed over time in terms of usage, but they will change from season to season. So if your crop has an infestation with this type of fungus this year, you'll use a specific type of pesticide, a fungicide on that. If next year you've got you know, a problem with whitefly, you use an insecticide, and you probably don't use the fungicide. So the, the pattern of usage is very dependent on the type of crop, the type of atmosphere and environment that that crop's growing in, a whole host of other things. So it's an example of a highly variable, poorly documented workspace where you know, reconstruction of exposures is, is really tricky. And about the usage of uh, organophoric pesticides, are there uh, these days widely used? Or we are mainly using organophosphates and carbonates. So, you know, organochlorine compounds are less widely used, and that's part of this move to go to less uh, persistent active ingredients. But there's, there's still some usage, and there's still some concern about uh, usage of these, these compounds. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this I don't know. Use, usage does vary by country, and clearly, you know, that what's acceptable in Europe is not necessarily uh, you know, going to be what's happening in, in these developing countries, and the usage may be much more uncontrolled. So if you go to Malaysia, you'll watch. People with uh, fogging devices, spraying pesticides, just, you know, everywhere. Um, and they're doing that because of the problem with uh, mosquitoes and, uh, and dengue fever or uh, other uh, uh, communicable diseases. Um, but the consequence of that is that they get quite high exposures and the, um, the, the, the population also are exposed uh, to these compounds. Yeah. Yeah, um, apart from arsenic, the other active ingredient that has um, been identified, I think, is dioxin. It's just that <laughs> we don't use pesticides with the classic dioxin, PCDD, yeah. now, but there are other types of dioxin that are probably almost as hazardous that where exposure does occur. And there has been a lot of concern about the birth defects as well. Mm -hmm. but, but I, I, Minolis would know better than me, but I'm not sure what the overall state of the evidence is regarding pesticides and birth defects. Uh, I don't know. So if we're going to get an answer to this question, it's going to come from Minolis. <laughs> okay, so it's not really... You know, the, the purpose of my talk was to really... We have very, yeah. we have very good animal data, and, then and you know, we have very good data, and then we have very good data, and then we have very good data, and then we have eliminated the 2,4,5-T that had the, the DCD, and we're using only 2,4-D which is the second most used herbicide after glyphosate, yeah. but it doesn't have the toxic dioxins. And then they, they, maybe there are the octa dioxins, so they are not particularly toxic. Yeah. So, uh, so we, we cannot do this, these studies anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they were pretty, pretty good evidence at that time. Yeah, yeah. but you know, I, I, I think the, the point of my talk was to try and underline the difficulties that exist in terms of assessing exposure. And these apply to equally to you know, assessment of birth defects as they do to uh, uh, exposure resulting in cancer. It's just the time windows where you might be interested in estimating exposure will be different for the different compounds, a different end point, so One thing that is true for the, what John was saying about the use of pesticides all around the world, uh, the, the post-market use of pesticides is 
there's no control practically at, at a global scale. And you find things that surprise, you know, we found, as you know, in Crete, uh, in the study that Vinas was involved, DDT, recent use of DDT in Crete, that's crazy. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we know it happened because we measured it. Yeah. So it's crazy. And it's minor use, but, you know, you should have zero use And it's use, it is not important with some, uh, some products. So you have three things happening, as in the post market, uh, Control is practically resistant in many countries, and this affects also our predictions for effects in the, in the ecosystems. You know, we cannot predict well the effects on the human health, but we are interested also what happens in the ecosystems, and there are good predictions actually, because it's, as you said, it's who yeah. knows what, how it's used. But I have a question for yeah. you. For your by monitoring and the algorithm study, yep. so and you showed that it was you know it was not uh, it, it, it could identify well the algorithm, but there was a lot of variation. But part of it could be actually that what you compared the by monitoring study actually has a huge variation. So could you say a, a bit about about that? You know how how would you limit the by monitoring you know variation? Well, you know, clearly, you know, biomonitoring reflects not only the external exposure that the person has experienced, but also the metabolism of the compound inside the body. So it's a, a reflection of a much longer part of that chain of exposure than just the um, the, the external exposure. I, you know, I, I think you can design your studies more carefully if you want to try and minimise some of that by, you know, for example, having repeated measures on the same people. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that, you know, for me, the, the, the problem with the algorithm here is that it doesn't really provide a, a clear distinguishing between the high and low. Okay, they're significantly different, but it's only a factor of two. And if our high subjects are only double the exposure of our low subjects, it's not sufficient contrast to really be very useful in a, an ecological study. So that, that's, that's my problem. And I think part of the, the issue here is the algorithm is quite crude. You know, you see it's based on a very crude categorization of, uh, of application in terms of mixing. Um, only how many times did you do this? And it only has a relatively crude aspect for personal protective equipment use. So we can refine these algorithms to uh, make them better and to better reflect the conditions that people are experiencing. And as long as we can get reliable information about those circumstances, then we can improve the, the estimation. It's about matching the quality of the information with the depth of, uh, of effort in the algorithm. Uh, just to add something about biomonitoring. Uh, uh, biomonitoring is during exposure to organophosphites and carbamates. Because they, because they are inhibitors of the enzyme cholinesterase. It is very important to, uh, to check the pre-exposure level of cholinesterase. Because every individual uh, has a different uh, activity of cholinesterase. And that is very important in biological monitoring of persons that uh, are exposed to organophosphates and uh, carbamates. You know, in, in biomonitoring, people have moved away from cholinesterase as a marker of exposure for much the reasons that you've uh, suggested. And there's much more focus now on specific metabolites or the original parent compound uh, in the biomonitoring. Um, and I think that's, that's a move which is, is you know, to be uh, uh, carried forward. But you know, I, I, I take the point you make exactly. You need to be aware of these biomarkers and the variation that, that exists within the population. Yeah? Okay. Um, we can probably have a five minute break. But just five minutes. Not, not, not ten minutes, five minutes.